The devil's not in the house, God is. Him and all his angelic host and the Holy Spirit. And Father, I thank you. I truly do thank you that you came to us during praise and worship and you did a great and a mighty works. I thank you, Father, that you have redeemed us from the snare of the fowler and that we stand in the, in the total victory circle, not one foot in, one foot out, but we are totally in the victory circle proclaiming our freedom, proclaiming the freedom of the lost and the dying. And, Father God, we are ready to go out to bring in the harvest. And, Father God, I'm asking you tonight, there's a stirring in the atmosphere, fellas, a stirring in the atmosphere. God is stirring up the atmosphere for, for the miracles tonight. Receive that right now. If you're looking into the spiritual realm, you can see the stirring going around about just like a whirlwind. And God is stirring things up tonight. He's getting He's getting all of heaven ready to pour it into you tonight as you sit here in his presence. Just receive that right now. Just receive that stirring in the atmosphere right now. You know, some of you in here, God's saying he's given you newness of life. He's taken away that dead old person that you were, and he's making you a brand new person in Christ Jesus. Now, just receive that right now. Rece you know, I just see the blood of Jesus being poured all over you. You're being covered by the lamb. Just receive that right now in the name of Jesus. And God's saying, I'm, I'm letting no stone unturned tonight. I am setting you totally and completely free from the works of darkness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Father. We worship you, Father. We worship you, Father. Again, yeah, there's a mighty move of God going on right now. Whatever it is you need from God, He wants to give it to you right now. Thank you. Just don't you feel it? It's it's just a heavy a atmosphere of God in this room tonight. Just like a blanket He's putting over us. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world. You know, whatever we're feeling in here, if you're watching, you can feel it right where you're at. You know, there's just somebody who has so much pain that goes way down into your spirit and, and you you cry to yourself and you just go alone and cry to yourself because the pain is so bad and, and the rejection and all the junk that goes with the pain and God said right now, he's ripping that out of you right now. He's taking it out by the roots and you won't feel it ever again. <clears throat> Whatever that thing is that you've been crying out for God to do for you, he said you can have it right now. If you can believe, then receive it right now. God's saying right now he wants you to step into the th three-step program. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and as you step into the three-step program, you're going to stay free. And God say, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. And he's saying that you've been trying with your might and your power, but it's by his Spirit that supernatural things are done in your body. So right now it's not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Father that everything he spoke is taking place within your life. If you can believe and receive, tonight is your freedom night. Never to be bound ever again. And you know, when our praise and worship was going on, God spoke to me and said, I have been shaking the church and shaking the church and shaking the church. And he said, those that you see in here are the ones that, who have remained and outlasted the shaking. Amen. You know, so many people, they either don't think about where they came from or they think that, you you know, your mother just had an accident or you just don't know what's going on. You know, no, no, nobody is an accident. God knows exactly who is going to be born, to whom, and when, 
and he knows when you're going to die. And the problem with the body of Christ is you don't know who you are in Jesus, so therefore you make a whole lot of mistakes as you listen to the enemy tell you who you are, and you don't believe what the Word says about who you are. So this is what we're going to talk about tonight, this who you are in Christ Jesus. Now, a true believer practices forgiveness. Listen, they, these are the characteristics of a true believer. They practice this forgiveness. One of the signs of a true believer that will show that someone is a believer in Christ Jesus is that they will practice forgiveness and won't hold grudges against their offenders. All right, the second one is they love God. They're truly saved. They imitate Christ. And when they're born again, they have new faith. They obey Jesus, and they love others selflessly. They just love people, period, for no reason. And they are heavenly-minded. Now, this, this is the characteristics of a true believer. Now, God's presence is a profound and comforting reality for many believers. And while we may not experience it in the same tangible ways as the children of Israel did, with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, there are signs that indicate God is with us. You know, even though the, the children of Israel had the, had the fire and the cloud, they still murmured and complained. All right, so if God would show you a sign and a wonder that he's really with you, you would still complain. The majority of people would. All right, here are 13 prayerful signs that God's presence is near. All right, the first thing is you'll have peace and you'll have joy. When God is with you, you experience a deep sense of peace and joy. His presence calms troubled hearts and replaces gloom with joy. These two fruits of the Spirit are the ultimate proof that He is with you. Number two, spiritual witness. Your spirit bear, bears witness to God's presence. It's an inner knowing that He is with you, even when circumstances seem challenging. That's one of the points a lot of Christians don't follow. All right, it said, you have a spiritual witness. Your spirit bears witness to God's presence. It's an inner knowing that he is with you, even when circumstances seem challenging. You know, years ago, when we had a church split, before we moved into here, I laid out before God was crying out to him, and he said, I want you to go to Isaiah 54, and that's your scripture that you, just, that you stand on until the day I bring you home. And Isaiah 54, 17 tells me, no weapon formed against me will ever prosper. So and no matter what I go through, no matter how challenging these things may be, I stand on that. I'll say, devil, no weapon formed against me can prosper. No matter what you put me through, no matter what you do or what the people around about me do, it isn't going to prosper. God's going to intervene somewhere along the line and stop it. It also says, I was angry with you for a season but now I'm not angry with you, and I'm going to bless you. So, the, you know, God has been angry with me for a season a couple times. But when he was all through with his anger, then he started blessing again. So Isaiah 54 is a beautiful scripture to stand on. And if I was you, if you don't already have, if he hasn't given you a scripture to stand on, I would seek his face and say, God, what scripture can I stand on? All right. And Isaiah 54, 17 fits me to a T. So your scripture should fit you to a T, too. All right, the third thing is, if you're a true Christian, is hunger for knowing him. You have an insatiable hunger to know God more. What you know today isn't enough. You still want to know more tomorrow. Your desire to seek him grows continually. That song we sing, I love that song, we, the last song tonight. All right, the fourth thing is prosperity. God's presence always leads to prosperity. This doesn't necessarily mean material wealth, but rather a sense of well-being and fulfillment in Him. All right, Everybody's all, every time you hear prosperity, people think money, money, money. We, but we have to have prosperity in Jesus before the money situation comes around. 
All right, the fifth thing is effortless love. You love others effortlessly. God's love flows through you, enabling you to bless those around you. See that? Bless, and the sixth thing is ble- your blessing to others. You become a blessing to others. Your actions and words positively impact those you encounter. The seventh reason is resolute faith. Your faith remains steadfast. Even in challenging times, you trust God's plans and his promises. That's another point where a lot of Christians fail. You really don't trust God in all of your circumstances, maybe one or two, three or four, but not all of them. If he can do it in one thing, he can do it in everything in your life. And the eighth point is enjoying God's grace. You experience God's grace in your life. You personally experience God's grace in your life. You're not watching somebody else receive it. His favor and kindness are evident in your life. You know, when I always walked under the blessing, and one day God said to me, daughter, you're now walking, going to walk under the curse. And what a difference. When you walk under the blessing all your life, and all of a sudden God puts you under the curse. Everything just does a somersault. And life becomes a living hell because of the curse that you're walking under. All right. Point nine is unusual understanding. God grants you insights and understanding beyond the ordinary. His wisdom guides your decisions. Read that again. Unusual understanding. God grants you insights and understanding beyond the ordinary. His wisdom guides your decisions. And the tenth point is reverence for God. You hold God in high esteem. Your reverence for him influences your choices and behavior. Now, I want to go back to nine. God grants you insights and understanding beyond the ordinary, period. As I talk to people, they act like they don't have a brain in their head. You're just being around them. But when I talk to them, so much wisdom comes out of them. And, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, you would never know all that was down in there, (laughs) you know, because they act another way. So, you know, you know you're a child of God when, when you start speaking and all of a sudden all this wisdom comes up out of you. And you yourself didn't even know it was there. All right. Uh, If you read the bulletin, Sister Nancy Connor wrote an article on taking the blood to the court. I I would have everybody read that. It's very, very, very important. And I'm thinking, she's saying, (laughs) you know, she can't concentrate and her mind does this, and she loses thoughts. And I said, but look at this beautiful article she wrote in the bulletin. It's full of wisdom. So you, if you're God's child, that, that wisdom is in you. You just have to get before God and allow it to come out of you. All right? So don't tell me your brain isn't working. No, your natural brain isn't, but your spiritual brain is. There's a whole lot of wisdom in there. All right? So we're just going to have to switch tracks here and say, all right, I want I want my spiritual brain to, to kick in here right now, right? Thank you. All right, then the 11th is um, it manifesting God's character. Your life reflects God's character. His love, patience, and compassion shine through you. How many of you have seen people who have backslidden? And even though they're backslidden and they're being a mess, the um, love, patience, and compassion still shines through them. Have you seen witness that? Just because they're backslidden doesn't say the things of God fall out of them. They're still there. And I know a couple people, they don't even pull on them. They're just naturally, that's who they are. And even though they're, they're being a mess, the God in them isn't messed up. Are you understanding this? So just because you're backslidden doesn't say you all automatically are not a child of God. That's not true. Because everything God has placed in you is still there. You just have to start drawing on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, the 12th point is boldness and spiritual authority. You operate with boldness and spiritual authority, period. God empowers you to impact your surroundings. You know, 
I used to be very, very quiet, and I'm not very, very nothing anymore. You know, I just say I'm just really bold and say it the way it is. And, you know, and I realized, and I been went to God with it that when it first started, and he said, you have to become bold. You can't stay the way you are because you're going into a new dispensation. And now in this dispensation, you have to be bold. All right. So if you've been really quiet and mild, you know, and and just let everything just walk over top of your head or wherever it walks and you find yourself all of a sudden standing your ground and you have a backbone of steel and a forehead of flint is because we are in that dispensation of time of fighting with the enemy where we need boldness. All right. You know, these are all marks that you're a child of God. All right. The 13th point is freedom from sin and demonic oppression. God's presence brings freedom. I don't care what's going on around about you. You still, still, you're still free. And, you know, you can conjure up all you want being upset. But if you just stop the nonsense, you find out you're not upset, that you're really at peace. You know, it's just old nature trying to get in there in, in and act dumb. So we don't want that no more, do we? We want our freedom from sin and demonic oppression. So then God's presence brings freedom, and you experience victory over sin and spiritual battles. Oh, did you hear that? You experience victory over what? Sin and spiritual battles. Remember that God's signs are diverse and can manifest in various ways, you know, in you. They can come through feelings, dreams, encounters, or scripture. His presence fills you with joy and peace. Trust that he is always with you, guiding, protecting, and blessing you. You have to know that you know that you know that no matter where you go, what you do, that his presence is always with you, guiding, protecting, and blessing you. What I want to talk about here right now is we all know that God's word tells us that he knew us before the foundations of the earth. We all know that God is the one who placed the seed in the mother's womb. And God knew exactly who you were going to turn out to be and what you was going to do from point A to point Z. And how many times have I told you, you have to know that you know that you know that you are called of God or the enemy is going to take you out. The problem with the bottom, bottom, the body of Christ is that you don't know that you know that you know that you are called of God. You think maybe you are or somebody might have told you, but you didn't. God, you never heard God tell you that personally. And that's why I'm glad I was ordained the way I was, because I know <laughs> that I know that I know that it was God who's called me into the ministry and not myself nor man. I want each one of you in here tonight to get in your spirit. Did you know that you know that you know God planted you in a mother's womb somewhere? Well, how come he gave me that mother? Don't ask, go ask God that. I don't know those answers. But what does it matter? He, you might, your seed might have been planted in that mother's womb because he needed you to be strong at a young age. So you didn't have a mother that, you know, that you thought was meeting up, was up to par. But God knew if he put you in a, in a mother who was going to love you and nourish you and you know, do all the wonderful things that everybody thinks they should have, that you would turn out to be a little wimp. And God couldn't use you for what he wanted to use you for. But if you were raised in a family that was a mess and you feel like you've been cursed, you feel like you've been left out, don't. God needed you to be strong. I mean, you know, my father, I was a second child of six, but I, you know, he said, you have more brain than your sister does. So he held me accountable for what all the other children did. And he says, I'm teaching you how to be a leader at 10 years old. So God knew what he had to do because he knew where he was taking me. And he knew I was going to be a leader. And so I was got a stepmother. <laughs> They're really good. You know, they can really help God out a lot to make you strong. 
<laughs> and bless stepmothers, really, truly. I'm not put, but you know, a lot of people fuss about their stepmothers. Don't do that. That might be a vessel that God's using to make you who you are today. So let's quit cursing the womb that we were born in. God placed that seed there. You didn't get pregnant by accident. There's no accidents in, God, in, in God's kingdom. We are all precious children of God. Now, we know that God's no respecter of persons. But we also know that there are people that have special anointings. You look at Catherine Coleman. You know, uh, you can look at Benny Hinn. You know, and just the other day I was saying about Joe Osteen. I think I was talking to Aaron, and I said it makes me mad the way they poke fun in him and everything else because he is of God. I think, I don't know, it might have been Teresa I was talking to about it. I said it really makes me mad when I hear them poke fun in him. The man is really anointed of God. You know, when his father died, he was a sound person. He didn't want to preach the word, but his father said, you will take my place. And so he did. Look how God has blessed that church. When he bought that building, the, his brother and everybody else said, don't do that. You don't know what you're doing. But he said, God said, and look where he's at today. And I just heard that he had a shooting in his church today. You know, but he is truly called a God to do exactly what he's doing. And I even said, if you watch his program, he gives his little message of faith or whatever he's given. And then they do the altar area and him and his wife both are down there in the altar laying hands on people. They're not sitting up on the platform, excuse me, like a lot of people are watching. They're down there with their hands right, right in with everybody else's. He has a special calling on his life to do exactly what he's doing. You have to understand that we're not all the same. I'm sure glad there's not 20 of Allens running around this church. <laughs> I just pick on him tonight. <laughs> You know, aren't you glad we're, we all have different personalities? But all of our different personalities make up the body of Christ. And this is why, you know, God says, don't try to be somebody else. He called you and your personality. So be content with who you are. If you're not content, just smack yourself really good and say, become content. Because I am what God wanted me to be. And then be what God's called you for to be. And, you know, when God called me, I was 50 years old, minding my own business in a little Methodist church, and God called me. Now, I know that God gave me special, a special anointing. I know that. Yeah, raise the dead, cast out demons, walk through a crowd and people are healed without me even though they're sick. I know that I, that God has set me apart to do special things. I have to walk in that and yet stay humble in that so God can use me the way he wants to. You need to look at your own life. What is it in your life that is different than anybody else's? And then walk in that. You know, if it's godly, walk in that. God does have people. You talk about his disciples. He had 12 disciples. He had one favorite, and that was John, the one that was in, in Revelations. And he loved John with all of his heart. He loved the other ones too, but John was his favorite. Peter was jealous of John. What are you going to do about him? <laughs> and God says, none of your business. If you really read it, that's what he says. And so we have to, don't worry about what, what God's going to do with somebody else. Be concerned with what God is doing with you and be content in that. Quit trying to climb the ladder that God didn't put under your feet. You know, stay in the place that God has planted you and allow God to take you where he wants you to go. All right. All right, so what is the difference between God's presence and his absence? God's presence. God's presence transcends our human understanding. It extends beyond our hearts, minds, feelings, and thoughts. We just don't understand God at all. The other day I said, God, you're right. I don't understand you and your ways, and I don't. And the sooner you can come to grips with that, the better off you'll be. 
You're, you're not God. You're never going to understand what he's doing. Even when we perceive God is absent, he remains at the center of our existence. And you know, he always tells me, I never leave nor forsake you. I am here with you in this mess that you're in. And that's in Hebrews 13, 5. Um, you have to know that no matter what you're in, God is walking through that situation with you. God tells me over and over again when I was in all the dire straits I've been in and since I became born again, I'm here with you. I'm holding your hand. Keep walking. Keep walking. Don't stop. That's why I like Toby Mac's song. Yeah. Don't stop, he would tell me. Come on, keep moving. And, you know, if you really know who you are in Christ Jesus, you'll understand He Hebrews 13.5 means you too. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't care what you're going through. All right? I don't care if you're being tortured, you're being raped, you're being shot at. God has a protecting angel right there with you. And he's allowing things to happen in your life that's going on. And that would happen in Job. God said, what are you doing, Job? He said, I'm walking to and fro. Seeking whom I can devour. Then God said, have you considered Brett? Let's just see what you can do with Brett. And so he gave, gave Brett to Satan. And Brett can say it was a trip he wished he hadn't gone on, right? But, but Brett proved to Satan that he wasn't going to break. Didn't you? <laughs> he proved to Satan he wasn't going to break. And God knew he wasn't going to. God will not say to Satan, here, try Aaron, if he knew Aaron was going to fall. He wouldn't do that. He knows who are his. And he knows who is going to withstand all the attacks of the enemy. But you don't know that. See, you have to get that in your spirit. I am a child of God, and I can go through anything that Satan puts me through because God already knows I'm, I'm going to make it, and he's given him permission to prove to him, you know, Satan that I'm not going to fall. See, if you don't have that in your spirit, the devil's going to take you out. All right, where am I at here? Even, okay, uh, in prayer, the distinction between God's presence and absence dissolves. They coexist, coexist and they, they are intertwined. Sometimes God's presence feels so beyond our grasp that it appears as absence. How many of you have been praying? Say, God, where are you at? <laughs> you know, you don't feel nothing but void in the air. Where are you at? And if you're listening to that real still small voice, <laughs> he's saying, I'm right here. Keep moving. You can do this thing. But that's why he says, he who has an ear, let him hear. And then he said, I'm coming with my still, small voice, you know, in that scripture. And, the, you know, he's not in a whirlwind and this and that and the other. And God said, I'm never going to shout when I talk to you, daughter. It's always going to be with a still, small voice. And he never shouts. That's probably why my kids said to me, why do you shout? <laughs> you know, when I get upset. <laughs> but I'm trying not to do that anymore. Because God never shouts if he's upset with me or not. He takes that little still small voice and makes you feel smaller than what you already feel, you know. Because you can do this thing and you're acting stupid and you're acting like you can't do it. All right. In that moment, that utter, okay, now we're going to talk about the cross here. I said sometimes God's presence just feels beyond our grasp. That it feels like he's not there, but he is. All right. In that moment, that utter aloneness, acceptance, and emptiness Converge when it all converged on the cross, Jesus was nailed to the cross and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you deserted me? And some scriptures say, Why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus felt like God had, to, had forsaken him. So, guilt trip, go away. Jesus went, went there too. He even said to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, what, you can't even pray for an hour? Stay awake and pray for an hour? I'm going to be crucified here, and you won't even stay awake and pray with me, and you're supposed to be my friends. So when your friends desert, you quit acting stupid. If they did it to Jesus, they're going to do it to you, right? Darkness revealed, okay, so then darkness covered the earth, and so when it did, it then it revealed new light, and death, when Jesus 
died, then we received life. God's absence paradoxically unveiled his profound presence. In other words, when God, when Jesus thought God wasn't there, you know, and everything turned black and this and that, and the other, everything happened, and Jesus thought he wasn't there, he really was there. But he had already told the devil he could have him. And he couldn't, he could stop it, but yet he couldn't stop it. Because if Jesus hadn't died on the cross, you and I wouldn't have any place for salvation. Right? God's absence. When we are not aligned with God, his presence may withdraw. It not may, it will. <laughs> you know, and God's presence is there with the Holy Spirit. And when, and when you're used to living with the Holy Spirit 24-7 forever, it seems like, and then all of a sudden God withdraws his anointing because you did something stupid, which is the Holy Spirit that he withdrew. And the only time you felt, felt the Holy Spirit was when you was behind the pulpit. All you want to do is sit here. <laughs> because you knew when you stepped down on that floor, you were alone. God made me go through that for one year because he told me not to do anything else. I'll do it if I want to. He says, go ahead. So for one year, he withdrew his spirit the only time, and he wouldn't let me quit preaching either. He made me preach, and that's the only time I was anointed. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. You need to know who you are in Christ Jesus and stay there and quit doing dumb things. All right? Please don't do any more dumb things. It's not worth it. If you're wondering whether you are a special, chosen, hand-picked child of God, there are some signs and reflections that might provide insight. Keep in mind that these signs are not visible to the outward eye, but are rather a result of the inward working of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you something. I want you to think to yourself, has God said to me, I have handpicked you, and you are unique and special. If you are, this is what we're talking about here, all right? Deep and abiding faith, a genuine and unwavering faith in Jesus Christ is a sign that you've been chosen, handpicked by God to do a special work. Not the, you know, everyday thing that the church does, but a special deep work. This faith is a gift from God and is grounded in the truth of his word. It char is characterized by trusting God's goodness and mercy. You're going to have to know that you're special. You're going to have to know that God's going to have you do things that other people are not going to do because he's anointed you to do them. And it doesn't matter how many sticks and stones are thrown at you, you're going to stand your ground. In humility, listening to the still small voice of God, giving you instructions, what he wants you to do. Are you hearing this? All right. When, you know, whenever I was ordained, they say, well, what kind of credentials do you have? I said, um, I don't have any. <laughs> you didn't go to Bible school? No, I didn't go to Bible school. Went to college. That didn't matter. They wanted me to go to Bible school. They did not want to ordain me. But the wife of the pastor said, so stop. This woman is called to God. The Holy Spirit's here. And we will ordain her. And then when she said that, the Holy Spirit dropped in on that platform. That pastor got tears in his eyes, and he said, we're going to ordain her right now. And he said, not her congregation, not me, but the Holy Spirit is ordaining her. That's how I know that I know that I know that God's called me into the ministry. So what I'm saying here, what if something adverse happens to you? You know, Because this was on TV. This is church over in Maryland, a big church. It was on TV. And here I sat. <laughs> I, would, I said, God, if this is not of you, please, I'll get up and walk down there and sit with them. I, I, will, not, I will not stay here if this is not of, not of you and me. And that's when, when I said that, that's when the pastor's wife said, stop. Because they were just tearing me apart. And then the Holy Spirit ordained me. Do you understand this? So if something adverse is happening to you whenever you know you know that God has called you forth to do something, 
Don't get upset about it. You like I did? I said, God, I said, if this is not you, I will go sit down. All you have to do is say, go sit down. And then God took over. Now, if I'd have stomped my feet, throw the fit, how dare you? He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have done anything. But I didn't do that. If you're going to work with God, you, you have to learn to be humble. You have to learn to be spit upon. You have to learn how to handle stones and sticks when they're thrown at you. Amen. The older you get in age, the more you don't want to handle that kind of stuff. You want to turn around and, and slap them back. <laughs> I'm just being honest. All right. I don't know where I'm at even. Desire to obey God. Our desire to obey God. If you have a heart inclined toward righteousness and a longing to please God by obeying his commands, it's a sign of being chosen. This obedience isn't burdensome, but a joyful response to God's love and grace. I've told you that from little up, I, my mother said, you love everything. <laughs> and I did. I just loved everything, everybody. You know, I didn't. And if, if somebody was being put down or come against, I had compassion for them. And I became their friend, you know, and did things for them and with them. And I was just like that until what, about nine years ago? I started losing my love walk because I'd had enough of being walked on. But see, if you're following God, you never have enough of being walked on. Remember that. You never have enough of being walked on. Jesus never did that. So then I had to work through that mess that I caused my own self to go into until I got my first love back again and started loving people unconditionally. And even sometimes when you love people unconditionally, sometimes it just is far more than you can bear at the moment. And you do your little dumb thing. But then you, then you have to go and repent. <laughs> you get back on that love wagon again, right? I think love is the most wonderful thing in the world. And you know, the more and more you read the word, the reason why you believe that, think that is because God is love. And if you're a true child of God, you, you'll want love. You, you want to be a love vessel. You want to pour that love into people. But if you're not chosen of God, you're not going to want that love. All right, love for others. The Holy Spirit produces in the hearts of the, cho of the chosen a deep and genuine love for all people, regardless of race or social status. This love reflects the love that God has shown them. You know, God will tell you when to quit loving somebody. He really will. Well, what he says is, he says, enough. They want, they are not receiving you. They are, they don't care to hear what you have to say. Walk away from them. And I was praying for somebody for years, and I said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, because that's what Jesus said. And but I did it with a pure heart. And God said, Don't ever pray that way for that person again, because they do know what they're doing. They calculate every step that they take. I never want to hear you pray that prayer for that person again. And I never did because God told me not to. So see, if you're really handpicked, chosen of God, you're going to hear his voice and then you're going to do what he tells you to do, no matter what the cost is. Sometimes it's pretty high, but in the end it's worth it all. All right. Um, passion for the gospel. Chosen individuals have an unquenchable desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. This passion isn't driven by personal gain or glory, but results from the Holy Spirit's work in their hearts. Remember that being chosen by God is a great privilege and responsibility. If you've been born again, love God in his word, obey his commands, and bear the fruit of the Spirit, you can have insurance, assurance that you are part of his great plan of salvation for the world. Read that again. Remember that being chosen by God is a great privilege and responsibility. If you've been born again, love God and his word, obey his commands, and bear the fruit of the Spirit, you can have assurance that you are part of his great plan of salvation for the world. Rest assured you've been handpicked by God for a purpose. Are you listening? Do you know that you know that you know that you were handpicked by God? You're a special chosen individual. And God did that for a purpose. 
you know, there's things that only you can do. People that only you will meet God, because God told me this. I'm not going to be able to reach everybody. I'm not going to be able to do everything that needs to be done, and neither can any of you. So we are called to do special things by God if we are handpicked and hand chosen by God. He has an agenda already laid out before you that you need to fulfill. All right, the question of why God chooses some people and not others has intrigued believers and non-believers alike. At first glance, it might seem unfair that an all-loving God would selectively choose who to save and who to condemn. However, a deeper look at the scripture reveals several key insights. The doctrine of election in scripture, the Old Testament provides examples of God choosing individuals or groups for, for specific purposes. For instance, God chose Abraham to be the father of his chosen people, right? And Israel as his treasured possession. In the New Testament, Jesus affirmed that his disciples did not choose him, rather he chose them and that's in john fifteen sixteen, the apostle paul emphasized that god chose believers in christ even before the foundation of the world let's read that again the apostle paul emphasized that god chose believers in christ even before the foundation of the world that's ephesians 1 4 before the foundation of the world he chose you God's sovereign choice. God's election is unconditional. It does not depend on any quality, decision, or action on the part of those chosen. If you really read about his disciples, they were all a mess. But they were the ones that God chose, or Jesus chose, and, and he used them mightily. As Paul states in Romans 9, God's election is not because of works, but because of him who calls. God's choice is an expression of a sovereign freedom and grace. It originates entirely with God, not human efforts. It's not about deserving or merit. Rather, it highlights God's mercy and desire to glorify his name. I didn't want to preach. I was very content to be in church and just do whatever. Scrub floors, wash windows, whatever they wanted me to do. But God had plans for my life. And so I had to do what God had called me. I didn't have to. But I did what God called me forth to do. Now, God told me when we started this church, he said that we are the, are the remnant church. And he said, we'll be a swinging door church. He said, I'm going to send in pastors that you're going to minister to. And then I'm going to send them forth to start their ministries. So I thought, well, pastors do come in here. But see, like... Aaron wasn't a pastor, but God sent Aaron in here because God wants Aaron to be a minister of the gospel. So he sent in him in here so I could slap him around a little and get him straight so God can use him to minister the gospel. See how that works? And so we have ordained. Many have gone out of here. We've Many have come in and said, this is too hard for me. I can't, I can't walk the walk that you preach. I can't do what, what you're saying I've got to do in order to serve God. But this is what our this is what our assignment is. And ever since I've been here, you know, in the ministry, God is when I was evangelizing, he always sent wherever I went was always church packed out with real pastors who were steeped in sin. <laughs> and as a prophet, God used me to tell them what they were not. You know, in other words, expose them. And that wasn't a joy trip. But still, in all, it didn't bother me either because that's what God called me to do. So whatever God calls you to do, the Holy Spirit goes with you and does it. Doesn't matter what it is. You know, we went up here in Maryland somewhere we went, and, and I was talking about everybody has herself titled bishop. And half of the bishops left the church that day. <laughs> I said, well, what I said was God showed me that you, he didn't call you bishop. You, and I didn't know they were in there. I nearly didn't. And but you, you ordained yourself as a bishop. Well, the half of the church left. And the other half stayed begrudgingly, but they stayed and left quickly after I finished. <laughs> they didn't want to be revealed. But anyhow, so what I'm saying is when God calls you, he knows who's going to be there when you minister. And he knows what their heart's like. He's not asked you to go in there and change hearts. He's asked you to go in there as a vessel of honor that he handpicked. And then just say, use me to say whatever you want to, Lord. 
And sometimes you just don't know when I'm going to prefer to pray. God, oh God, please don't say it. Make me say that because <laughs> I always hear it before I say it. You know. Anyhow, all right. Let's talk about the an ending. Let's talk about the parable of the wedding feast. Jesus taught that many are called, but few are chosen. All right. Matthew twenty two fourteen. In the parable of the wedding feast, the king invited guests, but they declined. So the king invited others from the streets, and they accepted the call, the chosen ones. The church has declined God's call. So that's why God has this harvest out there of all these lost people that he's going to bring into, the, into our churches, and God's going to raise them up, and they're going to be the ministers of the hour. The church has refused God, and God is finished with the church. He has shaken and shaken and shaken, and he has warned and warned and warned, and they do not want him. So he's left them. Don't be one of those that God leaves. You won't like it. And I don't care how much you, you cry and kick your feet, you're not going to be able to get in. Remember, he told us that years ago. To be chosen, we simply need to say yes to all that God places before us. We are part of his holy people, a chosen race, and a royal priesthood. And you'll find that in First Peter 2, nine. In summary, God choose, God's choice is rooted in his gracious mercy, and it ultimately serves to bring glory to his name. We can find comfort in knowing that we are chosen by God, not because of our own merit, because of his, but because of his love and purpose for our lives. All right. You know, when God called me, when I became born again, I said, God, I'm 50 years old. I wasted 50 years of my life. He said, no, you didn't. That was your training period. And now is the time that I'm calling you forth to do a great mighty works. And God revealed so much stuff to me that got lost. Um, it, it was awesome. It just revelation after revelation. And somehow or other, the tapes disappeared somewhere. But I do know one thing, that I'm called of God. And that I have a special work to do for the Father. And uh, this, for the last five years, the enemy's been trying to destroy my walk with God by bringing... Uh, disgrace upon my household but he did the devil's not the winner god is we all know that jesus his own brothers didn't believe he was who he was and he couldn't do anything in his own hometown and i can guarantee you the closer you walk with god the more your family's going to reject you and they're going to see all manner of evil about you they're going to talk behind your back but you have to stay loyal to the Father. All right? So I'm talking to the special ones here tonight. Handpicked, chosen by God to do a mighty works for him. Is your heart open tonight to receive the blessing that God wants to place within your heart so that you can go forth and do the mighty works that God is calling you forth to do? Now, don't rush to the altar. Stay in your seat, please. I'm going to, as God gives me names, I'm going to call, I'm going to call your name. And only if you are willing to die out to yourself and listen to the voice of God and do exactly what God's calling you to do, do I want you to come up front. God's going to call your name, but it's up to you. You cannot come up here with a double standard. You cannot come up here pretending you're something you are not. God's handpicked you. He's, he's chosen. You are really a special group of people tonight. But are you strong enough to answer that call? It's up to you.